If you tapped on this video, it's probably because you're interested in fine dining restaurants, whether that's working in them, learning some more about them, what they're all about, some behind the scenes on the operations, or maybe even learning some mistakes to avoid. Well, I've got good news. This is the episode for you. What is up, folks? My name is Justin Kana. I'm a chef myself, and I'm taking those lessons that I had to hard learn in Michelin kitchens, and I'm creating educational content around them to help you grow and expand your repertoire. Believe it or not, this isn't your typical standard YouTube video slash podcast episode. This is a coaching recording from a hot seat session inside of the Repertoire Pro community. Think of it like my private Discord server meets subreddit without any of the annoying ads. Inside the Repertoire Pro community, you'll find hospitality professionals from all over the world and from all walks of life and from different stages of their career. I think it's an invaluable place. I'm trying to build it to be the place that I wish I had when I was starting off in this industry where I didn't quite know exactly what area of the industry I wanted to go into and I just felt lost. I felt like I needed people to connect with. I was away from home. I wasn't really making that much money yet. And so it was one of those like my network was my net worth kind of thing. The community breaks down into individual spaces. So you've got Q&A stuff where I jump in and answer questions, but we've also got dish slash menu talk, an entire space dedicated to talking about gear, discussions on growing your business, content creation, if that's what you're into. And if you get some free value from this video, if you like what you see, if you want to continue to explore more and just try it out, I have a promo running right now. It's just a dollar when you enter the code FD101 when you go to sign up. You can have a look around the spaces, join a hot seat session just like this one, and go ahead and just post and get some insight or feedback on whatever you're working on. The link to sign up is in the description, but for now, let's get into this live session where I just go on a tear on all the basics of fine dining, a little bit of advanced tips and mistakes that I think everybody should avoid going into these high caliber environments. Enjoy. All right. We are live. Live is the wrong word because... Yes, we're live. Okay, cool. I do have some questions today that I'm very excited to answer from a, a community member who pri messaged me privately, but I did, you know, just ping, ping them and, and just confirm that I could cover this on the group coaching stuff because this is actually learnings that we're taking into the course for is allowing students to privately ask questions and then basically just say, do they want to be anonymous or not? Because that's a weird feeling. I, I, I've been in courses like that where I'm, I feel way more comfortable messaging the instructor one-on-one -on -one or submitting my question privately than just putting something out there to the group. Because oftentimes it can be, you know, just the madness of crowds as, as it were. Oh, my audio is good. Okay. To start a, on, on a, what is the note? The, the game show host note. I want to show some love to someone in the community. The platform that I use to host the Repertoire Pro community gives me a bunch of analytics. And there's different ways that this can be, you know, gamified in the future. So I want this to be kind of random, but there was someone, one of you folks, who has been not only the most engaged. So you've spent the most time in the community over the past couple of weeks and months, but also you've uh, left the most comments and likes and just been super conversational and be willing to be transparent. And that person is Ethan S. And so to kind of, you know, game, not gamify this, but, you know, just reward you, say thank you. I have a sharp edge shop, bunk of black. And I want to give this to you as just a thank you for, you know, being engaged and conversational and kind, continue to, to, to talk and engage. And, you know, I'll be doing extra surprises for, for members just like you in, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. And so stay tuned for that, but congrats to Ethan. Thank you. I will be sending you your new knife shortly, but the real kind of point of this session and if this becomes what you folks want to do, you want to send me questions privately and just saying, hey, can you please just cover this in the next call and you don't want it to be public? Totally fine. Just understand that when you post your questions in the Q&A space, you allow for perspectives that aren't just mine to answer the questions. And you might get some, you know, cool insights that are outside of just one guy's, you know, I'm an N of one. I, I, I certainly think through a lot of these topics more than most folks, but I don't see, I'm going to answer it regardless, you know, whether you post it in the Q and a space or private message DM me, but why not get the opportunity to get some more perspectives, then you can take it or leave it. You know, you might get some insights from someone and you're like, I don't necessarily think I agree with that, or that doesn't align with what my goals are, or I wouldn't really approach it that way. Or, you know, this person said to do this, but that that's not me. That's totally fine. 
advice is kind of like a take it or leave it. What, what is the thing that I heard the other day? It's like advice is like podcasts. Everybody has one, but, but you don't have to listen to everyone, something like that. Anyways, let's talk about the, the, the questions that came in today from Cade R. And so Cade basically has a story where he's starting at a restaurant in Chicago. And he had a couple questions because this is his first kind of foray deep dive into fine dining. And so he wrote me a bunch of stuff and I kind of distilled it into a couple of talking points slash questions that I want to cover in the session today. And then hopefully this will provide some insight to you folks. So first, fine dining restaurant fundamentals is kind of my first dot point that I, that I wrote down. And this might seem super rudimentary, but you know, there, there's a certain point where some of you folks might even feel this. You might not remember what it feels like to be a beginner. And I acknowledge that. And I, I think it's so important to understand that like, if you spent three, four, seven, 12 years in this industry, the idea of walking into a kitchen and not even knowing what to expect can be very foreign. And so that's why I want to really drive these points forward and just really, I, I'm happy to cover this. So fine dining restaurants, the way that I like to kind of draw the similarity or the analogy to, that I like to connect in my brain is it's kind of like Cirque du Soleil. So the people who are, who go to a Cirque du Soleil show in Vegas, for example, have never probably been to that show or they have been to that show before and they're coming to you for a very specific type of experience. And the folks that do Cirque du Soleil, the acrobats, the jugglers, the fire breathers, the dancers, the whatever, they have done this show yesterday and the day before that, and they're going to do the same show two weeks from now. And they're focused on what? Delivering the same experience every single night as often as possible. Because if, I, if Anna and I go to a Cirque du Soleil show, and I tell Cade, hey, Cade, you and your partner or your mom or your cousin, you guys should go to this Cirque du Soleil show because X, Y, Z. And whatever we say sets the expectation. And so you kind of have this funny dynamic where you're doing to the outside world just phenomenal execution, like so many thoughtful details and organization pieces and presentation specifics and, and all these things that, that create for when you sit down at a, you know, one star, two star, three star dinner, it can be fun, like, it, I, I still argue it's like one of the best bang for your buck kind of experiences. However, for the people that are executing it day after day, it's just another day at work, right? And so you kind of have to go into the experience expecting that. So what's an example? There was a, when I staged at Alinea, there was a rabbit consomme that got served alongside a rabbit course. And inside of this little bowl with a lid, like a cloche on the top, there was a, like a bouquet garni of, I think a cinnamon stick, rosemary, thyme, a couple of like cloves or, or something like that. And we, and a bay leaf, and we would tie it all together, snip the string in this perfect kind of little bundle. And you would have to put that inside of the, the bowl with the cloche so that when the rabbit consomme got poured on top, it would steep for a couple of seconds and you could kind of have additional aroma as you're drinking it. That was one component of one presentation of, you know, a very long tasting menu. And so but, but to the guest, it's like this, oh my God, this is like, I've never had rabbit consomme to begin with. And, and not only that, but they took the time to tie a little bouquet garni just for me, it's such a special experience. But for the chef de partie that's in charge of that little bouquet garni, it becomes something that is just like, that's another task on the to-do list. And so what you need to keep in mind is that, and I teach this in the total station nomination course, there are areas in a kitchen so you might say hot app section or pastry section or roast section, like the, the main course part of the section or the hotline, maybe, maybe. So areas are made up of projects. 
So projects might be, you know, the, that, that rabbit dish in its entirety. So the rabbit and the, the consomme and the blackberry sauce and the roasted celery root and the shaved celery pieces that curl a little bit when you put them in the ice water. And then projects are made up of tasks. And so when you start to look at it like this, you will probably not be in charge of an area or even a project. You're going to get some tasks delegated to you. And these tasks kind of help chip away at getting yourself all the way to that place where the area is ready for showtime. Because that's effectively what it is. Guests are showing up at five o'clock. Uh, you have another seating at seven. And then maybe there's another seating at nine o'clock, depending on how they organize things. And so you having this understanding of, oh, it's not about me running a station because that's realistically not going to happen when you start. You have to be able to tackle tasks first, then you will get put in charge of projects, and then eventually you'll get put in charge of an area, right? This becomes like chef de cuisine is in charge of the area that is kind of like the, the savory part of the tasting menu. Make sense? So a lot of times there's also different standards that get applied to fine dining prep and workflows and organization that if you're coming from a different restaurant kitchen style environment, it might just be completely foreign to you. What's an example? At almost all of the two-star and three-star places that I worked, Mise Plus had a three-day life to it. If you made something on Tuesday, you almost could guarantee that you could not use it on Friday because you Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you would almost always get rid of your stuff. And that was accomplishing a couple things. It was making it so that people wouldn't, people would only make what was required because depending on the place, there usually is like, there's a curve to how the guest count goes. And so on Tuesday, Wednesday, you're at this kind of low end of the curve. Thursday and even Friday, you'll see like, I should put some numbers to this. So Tuesday, Wednesday might be 40 guests. Thursday might be 60 guests, Friday might be 85, and Saturday is 100. And so there's this kind of curve that goes up. And, and if you're open on Sundays, maybe it drops off a little bit, but most places are open five days. And there's this ramp up that happens. And so when we're talking about prep stuff, usually planning for, don't think about this like, you know, if you've worked in a bistro where you come in on Tuesday and you make coleslaw for the entire week, or you make barbecue sauce for the entire week, or you make salad dressing for the entire week, that often doesn't happen at fine dining places. And the why is, is part food safety, right? You don't want to, the, it provides incredible binary confidence in the management team that no food safety stuff is going unlooked because nearly everything almost everything aside from, you know, like fermentation projects or pickles or, you know, like really expensive meat sauce kind of products, almost everything on any one station is no more than three days old. That's a great, you know, kind of binary thing to kind of think about. When you think about the workflow stuff, it actually kind of makes sense because if on Tuesday you make a one times batch of that thing and that thing gets you a uh, hundred portions that's going to get you all the way through Tuesday at 40 covers, all the way through Wednesday at 40 cover at 40 covers. And then on Thursday, you can make a batch again, but you can make like a triple batch on Thursday. And then that will get you all the way through Thursday with a little bit of leftover stuff from Tuesday plus Friday plus Saturday. Does that make sense? And so that's more or less how prep goes. And, and I, I just like to say that because it can kind of be confusing of like, why am I being asked to only make, you know, like 80 portions of this thing? And so that's also part of it. Another thing that, that, you know, can often catch people off guard when they go into a fine dining place is cleanliness standards. And I'll, again, hate to keep plugging the course, but I am going to do a shameless plug for the course because it is, you know, what I wish it, it's all distilled information. And so the cleanliness piece comes down to a principle that we talk about in total station nomination, which is, is this necessary? And if you can approach an experience at the restaurant that you're talking about in Chicago, 
where every single time you look down at your station, you ask yourself, is this necessary? You will start to pare down what's on your station and you won't get to this place where you're ballooned and completely overwhelmed with what you see in your workspace. So let's say that you're going from shaving that celery that's going to be put in ice water to then also, I don't know, peeling beets, for example. You might get done with the shaved celery project and you have, you know, like your, your food waste container and your a container with ice and your cutting board and your mandolin and, and I don't know what else you would have on your station for that. And then all of a sudden you find yourself on your beet peeling project. If you look down at your station and the mandolin is still there and there's still a container of ice that you don't technically need for this beet peeling project, you would look at that and you would be like, this is not necessary. And the most important thing you can do in that moment is pause, take a second to kind of like rinse the mandolin off, you know, sanitize it, put it away, take the ice, you know, like either dump it out or ask, does anybody need ice? You know what I mean? And then, and then you can kind of move on from that project. And then you will get to this place where everything that's on your station is only pertinent to that singular project. And that's incredibly helpful because most times, as I shared, if you're in charge of a project, again, back to that hierarchy, it might make sense to have multiple things going at the same time. But when you're starting at a place and you're just in charge of tasks, there's only a place, there's only a, like a, a maximum number of tasks that you can be going on at the same time without having a degradation in performance. And so keeping that top of mind is, is kind of, it's crucial. And the second point that I'll, that I'll add on, on just cleanliness and overall sanitation is oftentimes you'll see breakdowns happen at different points in the day. And similar to my point on three-day shelf life for things, this is another point that kind of, it confused me a lot when I was first starting because I was in culinary school, you know, we would walk into a clean kitchen, we would do all of our prep, we would do service. And then only at the end of when the last ticket went, would we start to break down. In a lot of the fine dining kitchens that you'll probably go into, there's an additional point of breakdown that happens during the day. And so for a lot of kitchens, this is right before staff meal. And so the way that this will look is, you know, you arrive at noon, you prep from noon to three at three 30, maybe you break down for 30 minutes. You have staff meal at four and service starts at five. And what that moment of cleaning does is again, it provides a little bit of that assuredness to management on food safety. So there's nothing from uh, the chicken prep or the fish prep or the shellfish prep that is still lurking underneath somebody's cutting board because we removed all the cutting boards from the countertops and we scrubbed everything down and we did the floors. Do you know what I mean? So nobody's working through service with beet peels, be you know what I mean, from the beet peeling project on their station. And so that's another thing that is incredibly, incredibly helpful. And maybe the last piece that I'll share, you know, there's, there's obviously other details that go into this, but, you know, as we talk about fine dining fundamentals, I think that there's another, so, so we talked about, you know, just kind of like standards. That's, I think the first thing that catches people off guard. And the second piece is a little bit of a communication thing. If you were a, maybe this is the wrong I'm going to make a poor analogy, but, you know, a street performer, right? You're usually loud and a little bit boisterous and you need to kind of get attention from the people that you perform to on the street. You're still doing flips and, and dance moves and you have music going and you're, you're still getting paid to perform. How do you think that would be different from going into Cirque du Soleil? So you're kind of doing the same thing. You're still dancing and flipping and doing the splits and whatever it would probably be a little bit more cutthroat is the wrong word, but I think you kind of know where I'm getting to with this. There would be a little bit of an air of SEAL Team 6 kind of conversation happening. It wouldn't be so much about kind of like shooting the shit and being casual. It would be like, no, we operate at a really high level. And so it's not, you know, when you get to a certain place, maybe it's okay to shoot the shit, but there's a big trend that you'll see in fine dining kitchens of like, only necessary communication and keeping that in mind can prevent you from, you know, having this kind of like, 
So I was in Florida last week and don't do that in a fine dining kitchen, at least not on day one. When you get to a place where people are asking you, you know, where's the last place you went on vacation? What do you like to do on your days off? Things like that. I think then it's totally fine to open up. But that's the difference, I would say, where there's such a focus on, again, maintaining those. There's a lot of work and attention that's required to maintaining those standards that we just talked about. And having that sense of only necessary communication can really help you from, you know, potentially... I don't know, getting to a place where you're, you're frustrated with how you're being perceived or the reputation that you're establishing for yourself in the team. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. Next question or dot point that I had was managing high cover counts while maintaining high standards. So let's talk about that. High cover counts are challenging a little bit to your point because you can do more. The problem is keeping the execution the same, keeping the details in mind, not getting bogged down, not having the quality suffer. I just did a post in the community and you folks should read this if you haven't seen it yet. But I went to a pop-up uh, and they had this problem where they were serving 25 guests and they didn't have enough staff to run food. And so the, you know, the, the, the service of everything got served to everybody just fine, but they wanted to have it so that the chef would get up and turn the music down and have a conversation with everybody about what the dish was. And it was really hard to do when they were operating at 25 covers versus if they were just doing 10, I think it would have been a little bit different. And this is a pop-up. So just take that with a grain of salt. The best thing that you can do, or that I would do, I would say, when you're doing high cover counts is to think about saving touches. So what do I mean? I'm sorry. I, I talk about this in the course as well. When we are doing plating, think about a dish of, so this is our plate. And on that plate, you're going to put a langoustine, a piece of grilled cabbage, a Parmesan twill, and then a inside of an ISI canister, there's a shellfish foam that's going to come. So when I'm going around and plating, it is cabbage, uh, sorry, it's lang langoustine is one, cabbage is two, Parmesan twill is three, shellfish foam is four. That's four touches. There's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a better dish to do this with, but I'm, I'm going to stick with it but because, because, because I don't want to confuse anybody. So, and maybe let's say there's like some tarragon leaves that we're also doing on top of this whole thing. So that's, you know, each one of those tarragon leaves is another touch. Right, Because if I only told you there was one tarragon leaf, you could plate 60 plates faster than if I tell you you have to do three touches. Make sense? And so anytime you can either what's called like stack your touches. And so what this might look like, and you, and you might see this sometimes, is you put the tarragon leaves on the cabbage before it gets to the pass. Right? Or, or you know, you will, you will pre-sauce things, put them in the oven, and then pull them out. And then you can just put them on the plate and they can go versus having to like put it on the plate, turn around, grab your pot, make sure the sauce is seasoned and then go ahead and do you know what I mean? And so every single time that you can save a touch across, like just do the math. Like if it takes two and a half seconds to move something from one plate to the next or to kind of like sauce something perfectly or whatever, multiply that across 120 plates in a night. And that's how many, you know, minutes you'll save yourself during service. And so that tends to really, really help is cutting down on the number of touches that you're making, or at least that, that always really helped me. There are other things that relate to, you know, when you're working a station and you have a ton of covers coming in while maintaining high standards, if that ends up being something that someone wants to hear in a future coaching session, just like DM me or post this in the Q and a space, because I will go into that. I just don't think, you know, based on where you've shared, where you're at, you said you're a student at CIA. I don't want to dig into that, but decreasing touches is huge. And people don't often think about it because it's just plating. Like plating is like, is like, is like one binary thing. And they think about it in their mind of, oh, well, I'm just plating. When in reality, you can, you can open up plating and you can see all the individual touches that you apply to, you know what I mean? Like 
lettuce goes down and then we do the the cherries and then we do the crispy shallots and then we do the you know whatever for the salad course and so just calling it plating i think is a little bit too crude like it's not detailed enough and so that tends to really help and then it just comes down to communication right the the way that you might think about there's a great quote of like investors talking about like the goal isn't to make great returns on your money the goal is to not lose money and so the way that you might apply that to your situation is it's not about executing at a high level with high cover counts. It's about when you have high cover counts, what's the most frequent thing that goes wrong? And how can we just prevent that? So if the, the, the problem with high cover counts is I'm always ready with my protein, but my entremat is never ready with their garnish on time. And now all of a sudden I'm ready to plate 18 sea bass and my partner isn't ready with their garnish yet. And now all of a sudden we're behind. And then the other order for the 12 top just came in. And now we have 30 plates that we're trying to juggle instead of just doing 18 first and then doing the 12. How can I communicate with my station partner better? Maybe jump in and help them with this pickup because clearly it's a lot to manage. And then we all get to the pass at the same time. We do 18 and then we move on to the next 12, right? That's one thing that potentially goes wrong. Another thing that goes wrong is juggling allergies, right? And so I have something that I teach. It's called the out of place prep list, where you create a matrix before service that has all the plans and all the ideas and all the kind of like additional mise en place you have for when a no dairy sea bass order comes in. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what the plan is. Because how many times has that happened? You get to the pass, you're plating up 13 plates. All of a sudden, one of the front of house people says, and you have the one no dairy, right? And then you and whoever's plating look at each other and you're like, fuck, we need to roast a piece of cauliflower like right now. That sucks, you know, because, and again, this is like identify the things that go wrong. It's not about being a high performer. It's just about preventing the problems as frequently as possible. So hopefully that helps. If you can do those things, I, I, think, I think you'll be in a good place. Okay, last piece, making the most of a stint at a high caliber kitchen. A couple strategies here that have been helpful for me. So nine times out of 10, and I know this because I did a CIA externship, even if it's a stage, you know it's going to be a short-term thing. And a lot of times people think that you're spending time at Alinea, Jean George. Bennu. And that is a all-encompassing, I have experienced Bennu as a restaurant. And it's partially true because it's not like you're experiencing another restaurant, but what, what, what's really happening is you're in a snapshot of time. So Bennu as a restaurant has been around for years and it's going to continue to be around for years. When you hear people talk about spending time in a linea or per se, or any of these locations where the chef is reasonably high profile and there's a chef de cuisine that's more or less operating on a day-to-day -day with this person. From February 15th, 2021 to April 29th, 2021, that like three month stint is literally a snapshot in time. And the circumstances, the menu, the team, the guests that come in will all completely influence the ex kind of experience that you have at that place. And acknowledging that, I think, is step one, is that like, one, you don't know what to expect. And so you kind of have to take it as this completely unique and nebulous thing. There is no perfect, I'll give an example. I went back to Norway at the end of 20 at the end of 2019 to go get my suit for my wedding maid. I wanted it done by a Norwegian designer that I always wanted a suit from. And I went back to the restaurant that I was a sous chef at to to work basically because I was like, oh well, I can, you know, spend some time in the kitchen and that ultimately like led me to wanting to create the course. So it was a really impactful time. But 
the chef de cuisine was different and Gordon Ramsay came to eat at the restaurant while we were there. While I was there. And this was, I was there for 10 days, completely different experience than if I would have come just one month earlier in November and it would have just been like a normal week. Do you know what I mean? So you kind of have to keep that in mind as how can I make the most, like, how can I acknowledge that this is a snapshot and not an all encompassing experience at this place? That's potentially uh, number one. Number two is if you're at the stage in your career where you're an extern, a stagiaire, a prep cook, I think a lot of people will give you the advice of respect your time or like value your time, put a premium on your time. And I just never operated that way. I still don't operate in that way. I still do things for free. I still like don't charge people for things. I always share that piece of like value isn't always monetary. And I think going into an externship experience like that will make it so that, you know, people will say, oh, well, you're just being subjected to, you know, like unrealistic labor standards if you're the first one there and the last one out. And I've never had anything but good come from that. If you're, you know, getting expectations put on you, pushed on you, and the you're going to get yelled at if you don't show up early or you don't you're going to get you're going to get scolded if you if you don't stay late that i think is bad but when i was at per se the my am sous chef was daniel calvert he has he was the the chef at balone in hong kong and he's now in tokyo and he's getting michelin stars left and right for his projects and he was one of the youngest sous chefs ever at Per Se. I think he became a sous chef at 23. I wanted to do everything in my power to spend more time with that guy. And so what he would do is he would always do the, the, the charcuterie projects and mostly the foie gras stuff after everybody left. So he was AM sous chef. He was in charge of the commies and the stagiaires. He made some stocks. But after all of us left, he would stay after and do the foie gras torchons. So I asked him, can I stay after you, with you and see how you do this? I wasn't getting paid. So it was, it was no, you know, kind of sweat off that his back. But then I got to see start to finish how foie gras gets treated at a Thomas Keller restaurant. Not none of the other stagiaires did that, you know, our externs did that. And what it ultimately did was not just teach me the foie gras stuff, but it made me stand out in Danny's mind. So like when I go to Hong, when I went to Hong Kong in 20, when was it? 2016, 2015, there's like a video on my YouTube channel of me and my friend, John hanging out with Danny and James Henry in Hong Kong. So it was like, that was networking that happened that I exchanged my valuable time for. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't have skills. I don't have money. I don't have any of this stuff to give. What I do have is time. So it's like, let me, let me exchange time for this, these other things that I want. I want skills. I want techniques. I want insights. I want advice. I want networking. I want connection. I want mentorship. Right? So why not give a little bit of that and not be so precious with your time? Especially, you know, if you're at a place where you don't have kids, you know, you don't have a, a, a partner or family that you have to take care of or, or you know, any of the other sort of obligations. Again, if you, if you look at it as this is, you called it, a, I, I think I called it a stint. I don't know if you called it a stint, but it's a snapshot in time. And your goal is to potentially make the most of that through asking thoughtful questions, putting in extra time when it, when it might not make sense, you know. I think that's why my Cirque du Soleil piece is so valuable. Cause when you think about like, if you were to peek behind the curtain at Cirque du Soleil and look, what would you see before, before a show on the weekends, after the show is done, you're going to see the juggler spending a little bit of extra time working on their routine. You're going to see the choreographer doing a stretching routine just before the show. You're going to see somebody working on their costume. And you'll often see that at fine dining places too. 
You'll see someone coming in a little bit early to sharpen their knives. You'll see someone staying after to make the Fargar Torchons. You'll see a couple of people talking about how they're going to go foraging over the weekend. You're going to see someone talking about how they're going to go visit the dairy purveyor that you guys work with on the days off. And your job is to just be observant of those interactions and identify how can I, again, not be a leech, right? But almost be generous with like, let's say that you have an SUV. Hey, how are you guys getting to the dairy farm? I have a big car and I can fit a bunch of people in there. Like if it'd be helpful if I could drive, I would love to join. Do you see how that's different from, you know, like, you know, you're, 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 you're operating from like, how can I help versus like what it, but it's, but it's, it's, it's slightly different from like, you, you are being self-serving, but you're doing it from a place of, because I don't believe that anybody is inherently unselfish. All of us are, are selfish. We have to look out for number one, but it's like, how do you get what's good for you? I think that's the important thing to potentially think about with these situations. Okay. Let's see. Last couple dot points here, how to keep a level head and not let the pressure get to you during a rush. This is one of those things that is a little bit exposure therapy is maybe what I'll call it. And a little bit just understanding that it's just a performance. So let's unpack both of those. I'll start with the, the, the latter one because there's something that just kind of comes to, comes to mind. We would often, this is more at French Laundry, I think, than anywhere else. At the end of kind of like a really, you know, crushing day, like you just got destroyed, like you were behind a bunch of allergies, you know, for whatever reason, the menu just happened to get staggered where you just got like all the tickets at the same time and you went into service a little bit behind. So you're just constantly catching up and it was just, just a rough day. People would tell each other, like, it's just food. And I'm going to bring it back again to that Cirque du Soleil example of it's just food. Like it, it's just a performance. Like you are one part of one person's vacation that they will probably forget about. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I think people like us, like the, the industry folks, me to an extreme, I shoot a video in 4K, do a voiceover on it, edit it for hours and then post it on YouTube for a lot of folks, it's just like, this is just something, I mean, think about the, the, the business person who is just taking their client out to a place that they just want to impress them. Right. And I think what can be really motivating about a fine dining restaurant is the high standards and the incredibly detail oriented execution and the seemingly impossible feats that sometimes happen. But if you can approach it from both, like you, you have an appreciation for it, but you also understand like in, it's like perspective in, I don't even know what the number is. It's like in 500 million years, the sun is going to engulf the earth and none of us are going to be around. None of us are going to remember any of this. And so, you know, you can play it all the way on that end of like complete existential, like none of this actually matters to just like, this is just someone eat, like, this is just a meal for somebody. And decreasing that, because, because again, this comes back to my point of why do, why do you let the pressure get to your head? It's because you're thinking that like, you know, this is a reflection of me as a person. This is going to embarrass me. This is a, you know, like me having a negative performance is going to prevent me from having work in the future. Like you're getting too much in your head about this stuff. And so it's, it's, it's not, maybe it's not about having for you, it might not be about having the existential, oh my God, this doesn't even matter why I'm like, because that can lead to a really dark place. It might come from a place of why am I feeling this pressure? And then how can I alleviate that? That might, that might also help. It's also being in the business of two things. I think Jocko Willink with his like good speech you can look it up, Jocko, J-O-C-K-O, good, G-O-O-D, and it'll pop right up. It's basically this element of like, burned all your kale chips, good, gives you a chance to do it again. Customer complains that the chicken was undercooked, good, 
gives you an opportunity to, you know, use your thermometer better. I don't necessarily think that that advice holds up in kitchens all that well, because you do have a mistake, like a customer getting undercooked chicken and you're like, holy shit, that's not good at all. There's nothing good about this situation. So I think the better, you know, like for little things, you know, potentially that, that could help you. And so definitely look into that speech if it, if it gets you fired up. But I think the better way to kind of approach this is like be proactive versus reactive. And I think it can often get misconstrued as you're being a little bit too nitpicky or you're the type of person that when I think about all the high performers that I ever worked in, when that I ever worked with, where I was the one who was struggling and suffering, it was often the case that I was the one who didn't want to bring things up. Jordan Peterson calls this hiding things in the fog. And when you hide things, a la, I don't actually have enough beats. I know you told me to make 60 portions, but I only got 52. But I'm not going to say anything because I know that the beats take four hours because we have to make more salt dough and we have to go get beets from the store and we have to wrap them in the salt dough and we have to bake them for two and a half hours. And then we have to let them cool. And then we have to peel them. I know that takes a long time. And so I'm not going to say anything. And so that's what I would do early on in my career, because I didn't think that there was a solution that I could provide. And so I looked at it as oh, well, you're being the one to be the bearer of bad news. And so don't do that. Just be quiet, hide it. And every single time that I did that, it would bite me in the butt. Not every time. That's a lie. There were times where you could get away with it. But the, the, the hit rate on that is not worth, the juice is not worth the squeeze on that risk. And so when you're thinking about letting the pressure get to you, and keeping a level head, sometimes it just comes down to like being communicative with the people that you're working with of like, hey, I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed on this. Like, are, are we ready? Like, do we like, again, break it down, like, like use your language to kind of be a little bit more articulate of why you're feeling what you're feeling. So what's an example? So it's like you're getting told that you need to tie a bunch of those little bouquet garnies, you know? I tell the story again in the course of, you know, go to the person who told you to do that. And if they told you to do 40 little bouquet garnies and, you know, you have to do this before the breakdown happens at 3.30, you know, let's say for just rough numbers, breakdowns at 3.30, they delegated it to you at 2.30, you know, they told you to do 60, that's one bouquet per minute. You're 15 minutes in and you've done four of them you need to, you know, be proactive in that situation of going to this person and be like, Hey, I'm going to be able to have, you know, some decent headway on these, but I'm not going to have 60 of these done by three 30. You know, that's going to be a shitty interaction. It just is like, like, it's not going to be fun. The person's going to say why the person's going to be, you know, like you're going to, but, but like the difference between that and any of these moments where the pressure builds and builds and builds and then gets to this place where the, the chef throws things, has a tantrum, the guests have to wait for you know 27 minutes to get their next course, whatever might come. Oftentimes that comes from being proactive versus reactive. And it's the hardest thing to do when you're early because you don't feel like you're cut out to have those conversations. But even now, you know, when I was, you know, for any of the private events that I'll do. I see it as such an asset when people that I hire come to me with problems and even better, they come with solutions. And so there's like, there's a, there's a sliding scale of how effective you can be as a teammate. You go in the negative where you lie, you withhold information, you keep things in the fog. There's another one where you're just transparent, like as we're moving up the scale, you're being more transparent with folks. You're telling them that you have problems that are coming up. You're, you know, just, you know, just honest about like, hey, feeling the pressure. Don't necessarily know if I'm going to be there. I need extra time, blah, 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 blah. And then there's the other one of like, you're transparent, you present solutions, and you ask for help. 
that's a great place to be. And then again, I, the first point that I mentioned before I got on this rant is that it's just repeat exposure. So the first time that you, you know, let's say that you're, you're used to doing 60 covers a night and that's, you, that's, that's normal. 120 covers is going to feel like, oh my God, this is crazy. How in the world am I going to do 120 covers? And the way that you kind of look at this is like through a workout example, like if your bench press is 135, doing 225 just seems like complete and utter, do you know what I mean? Like it just seems crazy. But the way that you get there is not by putting 225 on the bar and not having anybody spot you and just go for it. Sometimes that happens. Then you actually get a sense of, oh, this is what 225 feels like. So again, it's not all bad. But the way that you get there is you add two plates to the side, like two, two 10 pound plates to the side. And now you're at 155. You work your, it's progressive overload. And how you get used to that pressure is if it's not going to be imposed by the forces that be, a la actual guests, you know, chef saying that you need to plate things tighter or, you know, giving you more than what you can handle. It has to come from you. What if you could bring that pressure into yourself and get used to it? This is why people talk about, you know, like taking cold showers in the morning is because it gets you used to being the person that puts yourself in uncomfortable situations. So again, how can you be the type of person that thrives well under pressure? Some practical ways you can do this is, okay, so-and-so told me, or let's say you have a task like uh, grilling leeks for this leek chutney that you make for a dish. Normally, you can do 60 portions of leeks grilled in 35 minutes. What would it look to just set an arbitrary stretch goal for yourself? Put a 27-minute timer on your phone or on a timer. What would need to change in order for you to do that? And I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but what is the math on that? That is something like a 20% savings in time that you've just executed on a task. You went from 35 minutes to 27 minutes. That's 20% pressure, quote unquote, that you can directly show, I can change how I think about my process when pressure is applied to me versus going into this place of frantic, chaotic, I don't know what's going on. How are we going to do this? You know, like tripping over yourself kind of action. And it's because, again, you've, you've self-imposed it versus having it being imposed on you because the stimulus is the same. Pressure is pressure is pressure. It's like, where is it coming from? It can hopefully help you. Because that's the other thing is that the pressure is going to happen someday might not be tomorrow, might not be next week. It might be in two months when all of a sudden you guys decide that like, oh my God, we're going for our next Michelin star and Michelin's coming next week. That's a lot of pressure. So curious about how the staff interacts with each other, if that's done differently in fine dining restaurants and just the energy in general. So I kind of touched on this. There's a little bit of, you know, you might see it as completely magical that there's a you know, tomato sphere that they make at the restaurant. Think about, you know, Alinea black truffle explosion. This is, you know, like a, a legendary dish. In the Cirque du Soleil example, this is just part of their day-to-day. -day. This is exactly the same as someone else, someone at an office job filling out a spreadsheet. It's something that needs to get done. There's a process. There's a quota that you need to hit. It just becomes work. And so understanding that, can kind of brace yourself for you hyping yourself up that like, oh my God, I get to do the cherry spheres, the tomato spheres. When in reality, it's just like, you just need to approach it like a, like a task, like a job, like a, like a, like a normal line item on a to-do list of like, what's the most effective way for me to approach this? Because again, it's like, what if, what if you heard that's like one of your family members was at a job and they were super intimidated by executing a spreadsheet for a report that they had to present to the marketing department. 
he'd be like, that's so stupid. Like, why don't you just figure out what they want and how to do it in the most effective way? You need to think about the, your work in the same way. And again, maybe this is like diminishing the magic of it, but you'll see it in these kitchens where people don't really care that they're working with A5 Wagyu. It's just like part of their day. You know, it's stuff to manage. Do we have enough? You know, like, what are we going to do if and when the person comes in that has the, that's a vegan tonight? like standard operating procedure. And so that's number one that I think, you know, you hype yourself up to think that these are these like magical environments where, you know, sorcery is happening. It's really not. And from an interacts with each other perspective, basically what you want when you're working in a fine dining kitchen is you want to feel like you're in control and you want to feel like and this, I'm talking from like the chef de partie perspective. And you don't want surprises. And I guess that's kind of related to the control piece. But it's like, you want to feel like you have enough of, of things. And you don't want, so, so what's an example? There's a phrase that I would often use with my line cooks, which is, do you have eyes on blank? Because oftentimes when we're talking about communication, it can be a bit of a game of telephone is the wrong analogy, but it's like, if I'm the line cook and I put in my order for beets the night before and the sous chef told me that they ordered the beets and the, the AM prep cook told me that we got produce in already this, that is not guaranteed that my beets are in that locket. And so this comes back to my point on being proactive and taking on the accountability of things. I would always ask my line cooks, did you get eyes on those beats today? And then it becomes a thing of trust yourself to be a source of truth of information. Because what's an example of how this might go wrong? You might have, this brings my whole conversation kind of full circle here. You might have two beats downstairs in the walk-in. They're in a produce bin. They're chilling there with the celery root. They both got consolidated into the same container. And those are actually left over from Tuesday because you did a one times batch of beet puree on, on Tuesday. Now it's Thursday and you need to make a three times batch going into the weekend. You talking to, you know, the person on pastry station and saying, do we have beets downstairs? They're going to look because they just grabbed the Buddha's hand, the Kalamans, like whatever, whatever it is from the container next to that salary root container with the beets in it. They're going to say, yeah, we have beets. I saw them downstairs. But two beets is not enough for you to make a three times batch of beet puree for going into the weekend. You feel me? And so you just having, again, that like get eyes on it, get accountability going. It's, it's, it's this dual sided thing of like not trusting people's, like getting the nuance. Did you see a full case of beets come in downstairs? Is a better question. Do you know what I mean? When you're talking about how people communicate in really effective ways, the idea of asking, a, asking the right question can often be the difference between you know, okay, I'm finally ready to go do the beet puree. You go downstairs and you look and you've been, you, you, you waste 10 minutes scrambling around the walk-in, looking in every single last bin, trying to find that case of beets. You're looking in dry storage. Did somebody put it in the wrong place? Is it still outside? That's 10 minutes wasted because you, you, you were told that the beets were downstairs. And so you're like, where, where are they? Like somebody told them, told me they're here. I only see two beets in this container with the cellar root. Where are the beets? oh my goodness, the beats aren't here. I asked the wrong question. And so that's why you might often see these kind of like, it seems rude. Like to be asked, did the full case of beats come from produce today? Might seem like a, oh my God, like this is such an aggressive question. Like why, why is this such a, but hopefully I just explained why those specific details are required. And why people need to like get to the point, just give me the answer, 
because anything other than that becomes incredibly problematic because you don't get clean data. If you don't get a clean piece of information, if you don't get the, the information that you technically need in the moment, it can bite you in the butt. So with that, that has been, you know, kind of like a deep dive into Cade R's questions about all things working in fine dining. Quick reminder that this is just a taste of what you can expect from the Repertoire Pro community. That's my online space. It's kind of like Discord meets a private subreddit for all things hospitality and being a professional inside of this industry. It's free of ads, free of distractions, and free of trolls from the comment section. If you're craving learning, connection, networking, bouncing ideas off of one another, or even being in a hot seat yourself to get your questions answered, I've made it easier than ever to sign up for your first month at just a dollar with code FD101 at sign up. Link is in the description. Thanks so much for your attention. As always, my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.